your guests. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to, to this annual Collegium lecture organized by the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies. The lecture will be delivered by Professor Nicholas Rose. Uh, and the topic is, as you can see, our brains, ourselves, from neuroscience to neuropolitics and the neurobiological self. So it's going to be exciting to hear what that actually means. My, my name is Sami Pilström. I'm the director of the Helsinki Collegium. I will just uh, very briefly introduce the Collegium, because there are probably some people, at least in the audience, perhaps many people who don't know much about the Collegium yet. I will say something about this uh, annual lecture and, and, and then briefly introduce our uh, distinguished uh, speaker. Uh, I would first of all uh, like to thank Maria Sokio, our program coordinator, for, uh, for organizing the logistics of, of this event, uh, as well, well as everybody else in, in, the, in the Collegium administration for uh, practical contributions to this. So uh, the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies is, uh, as you may know, one of the independent institutes uh, of the University of Helsinki. It's uh, relatively young compared to the university itself. Uh, we were established in 2001. We're not member. Of, we're not not part of any, any of the faculties, but we are still part of the university. So we have a, uh, a kind of an autonomous position within the University of Helsinki. Uh, we we operate as uh, as so-called institutes for advanced study uh, in different countries uh, within or or independently of universities. Uh, typically operate. Uh, that means that we uh, we host an interdisciplinary community of fellows. At any given given moment, we would have some 45 to 50 fellows working on on a quite ver uh, uh, quite a wide variety of topics across the humanities and so social sciences. So so we basically cover all the fields of uh, the five different faculties of the University of Helsinki City Center campus. So the humanities and social sciences broadly conceived, including law, theology, uh, psychology, education, and so on. Uh, as many of you may also know, we, we have a relatively competitive fellowship program in the sense that in our annual call for applications, the acceptance rate is typically around 4% or 4 to 5%. Uh, and we're also one of the most international units within the university, especially within the humanities and social sciences, because uh, approximately 50% of our fellows come from outside Finland and the other half from Finland at the moment. Now, uh, uh, this uh, so-called annual collegium lecture is, is one of the key events of our academic year. We have certain regular events that, that <coughs> take place Annually, and this is obviously one one of the uh, key uh, events organized typically uh, in the spring. Uh, I'm not going to to read through the the list of previous speakers in in this uh, series. All of them have been uh, very distinguished academics, uh, addressing uh, a variety of topics uh, in in their talks. The two most recent ones were Nancy Fraser and Axel Honet. And, and, and this, uh, this year, it's, it's, it's such a great pleasure to, to add uh, Nicholas Rose to, to this list of collegium lecturers. Nicholas Rose is professor of sociology and head of the Department of Social Science, Health and Medicine at King's College, London. His work explores how scientific developments have changed conceptions of human identity and governance, and, and also what this means for our political socio-economic and legal future. I'm not going to uh, read through the list of his, uh, the very long list of his publications. Uh, it's, it's also, in addition to being long, it's also very interdisciplinary. His work has also been translated into a number of languages. Uh, I'll just mention his latest uh, book called Neuro, the, brain, uh, the New Brain Sciences and the Management of the Mind co-authored with Joel M. Abi Rashid from Princeton University Press 2013. And there is, of course, uh, more information about uh, Professor Rose available on his website. <clears throat> 
thank you all for coming to, to this lecture. It, it's such a pleasure to, to see such, a, uh, uh, such an audience here today. And in particular, it's, it's, a, it's a great pleasure and honor to welcome Professor Nicholas Rose. So welcome to the University of Helsinki and the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies. Now the floor is yours. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming along to this, to this lecture. Um, I'd like to thank the Collegium and Professor Pielström for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be uh, back in Helsinki. I haven't been here for a while. I had a chance to meet up with some old friends. Um, and it's an honor to be talking in this series after such distinguished, uh, uh, distinguished guests who come before me. Uh, a little word of warning, uh, if you're expecting a highly theoretical talk about governmentality, uh, you may well be disappointed, uh, but there will be time at the end to ask all those theoretical questions, uh, which I probably ignored in this uh, rather blindingly empirical talk, but it's empirical for a conceptual purpose. So, can babies feel pain? According to a report, in the morning news on BBC Radio yesterday, brain scans show they can. Are poetry and mathematics related? According to a report in the same news program, they are because they activate closely related areas of the brain, and so on. It's difficult to know what to make of all this talk about the brain today. It appears as if almost every aspect of human conduct and human thought previously explained in psychological terms, should now be explained in terms of the brain. And responses from the social and human sciences vary from enthusiastic jumping onto the neuro bandwagon to critiques of neuromania. For those of you who know my earlier work, which examined the salience of psychological understandings of human beings in our present, I argue that these ways of thinking about ourselves uh, were intrinsically linked to new strategies for governing others and new strategies by which we governed ourselves, new systems of ethics. And that work on psychology was, I guess I'd call it a diagnostic exercise. It was a diagnosis with a kind of ethos of vigilance towards potential futures. It was an untimely exercise against the spirit of our times and perhaps one that might intervene in some small way in our present for the sake of those futures which might come. And that too was the ethos of my recent book, Neuro, which I wrote with my uh, dear friend and colleague, Joel Abi Rached. And in that book, we argued uh, for a relationship that was neither neuroenthusiasm nor neurocritique, uh, but a relationship which we called critical friendship, with the new brain sciences. And today's talk, uh, which is also an act of diagnosis, should be, offered, should be heard as offered in that spirit. Some of you may hear it as a talk which is against neuroscience, but it's not. Uh, it's a call for neuroscience to become a genuine human science. Now, neuro traced the history of neuroscience from the invention of the term in 1962 by Francis Schmidt, who was a biophysicist working at the Massachusetts Institute of uh, Technology. And we traced it up to the present. Now, in 1962, as you'll see in the quote here, Schmidt argued that we needed to understand the brain in the same way that molecular biology had begun to understand the body. There's an urgency, he says, in effectuating a quantum step in understanding the mind, not only as an academic exercise of scientific research, not only to understand and alleviate mental disease, the most crippling and statistically significant of all diseases, not only to create an entirely new science and hence to survive the present world crisis in human evolution, uh, but perhaps through an understanding of the mind to learn more about the nature of our own being. Now, when Schmidt said that neuroscience didn't exist, it was a project that he and others formed. But 50 years later, another very eminent neuroscientist, Vernon Mountcastle, said this, the half century's accumulation of knowledge of brain function has brought us face to face with the question of what it means to be human. 
We make no pretension that solutions are at hand, but assert that what makes man human is his brain. Things mental, indeed minds, are emergent properties of brains. So in half a century, we move from the hope that one might understand the brain in terms of molecular biology to a statement of belief that's probably held by almost everybody working in neuroscience today. There is a physical basis of mind in the brain. Mental processes arise in physical processes in the brain. Mind is what brain does. So how should we analyze this shift and its consequences? Let me begin with a remark from Michel Foucault's essay, What is Enlightenment? We should practice criticism, Foucault says, as an historical investigation into the events that have led us to constitute ourselves and to recognize ourselves as subjects of what we're doing, thinking, and saying. And it was in that ethos that I undertook my work on neuroscience to ask whether some events have led us to begin to constitute ourselves in a new way as subjects of what we're doing, thinking, and saying. It was an exercise in historical ontology, as we say these days, or perhaps in the ontology of our present and ourselves in that present. Now today, rather than rehearsing the argument of that book, which is actually now in a piece that has been translated into, into Finnish, um, I'm going to uh, address it in a slightly different way by focusing on some nodes, as I call them, rather unfortunately, couldn't think of a better word, could have called them plateaus, but that might have raised those Deleuzeans amongst you, raised your expectations. Uh, some nodes that can exemplify the range of mutations that we need to engage with if we're to understand this new ontology. There are the nodes. So the first node is the burden of brain disorders. First, consider the rise of the phrase, the burden of brain disorders. Now, we know that psychiatry has been a social science since the mid-19th century. That is to say, it's been bound up with the creation, problematization, and management of the social domain. And psychiatric epidemiology has played its part in that. And indeed, we could trace this right back to debates provoked by the US census in the mid-19th century about whether the number of freed slaves in lunatic asylums indicated that freedom was not the natural condition or the healthy condition for the Negro. There's a whole eugenic uh, discourse on the burden of degenerates on the race reaching its apotheosis in the Nazi calculations of the costs in Reichmarks to each healthy German worker of maintaining a feeble-minded or insane degenerate. That's a uh, classic uh, image from uh, Volk and Rasse in 1935 showing the healthy German worker bearing on one side of that beam a Jew and on the other side a degenerate. But psychiatric epidemiology as we know it today began after the Second World War and took its distance from eugenics and all those arguments about the burden of genetic disorders. It began partly in response to a perception of the scale of mental disorder in the non-institutionalized population, uh, uh, which became apparent during the Second World War itself. And there were a range of studies in various cities, mostly in the US, uh, which were much criticized because of their methodology and the vagueness of what they were actually measuring. But nonetheless, by the early 1980s, it was widely believed that some 15% of the adult non-institutionalized population suffered from a, quote, mental disorder, much of which was unrecognized and, quote, unserved by mental health services. And some indeed were contending that the US was facing a pandemic of mental disorders. From the 1990s, services, surveys in the US by Ronald Kessler and his colleagues, and I've just given you one there, which show 26.2% uh, uh, of adult uh, Americans in any one year and about 50% in a lifetime diagnosable with a psychiatric disorder. From that time forward, surveys seem to show that around 25% of the adult population not receiving psychiatric attention could be diagnosed with a mental disorder in any one year. And the annual figure went up to over a third 
once children and the elderly were included. And from around the 1980s, we see a range of attempts to quantify the experience of living with a mental disease, to estimate the costs to individuals, to families, and societies of mental disorders, and in particular of depression. This was also articulated in the language of burden, understood now not as genetic load on a population, as with eugenics, but as costs borne by healthcare systems, plus the indirect costs of time lost through productive work. Uh, productive work. The first global burden of disease study was initiated by the World Bank in, the World Bank in 1990, uh, and it shifted attention from the numbers of people dying from a disease to the number of people living with a disease, using their new measure of DALIS, Disability Adjusted Life Years. And in doing so, as is well known, it began to highlight the burden of non-communicable diseases, notably neuropsychiatric diseases. By 2011, Uli Vichen and his colleagues were referring to these disorders, both psychiatric and neurological, as brain disorders and calculating, quote, the burden of brain diseases that ran from anxiety to Alzheimer's and from insomnia to epilepsy. And globally, a growing movement took shape to address the grand challenges in global mental health which focused specifically on what were now called the MNS disorders, mental, neurological, and substance disorders, which were said to constitute 13% of the total global burden of disease. So what should we make of this argument? I find the term burden particularly distasteful, as indeed to those who live under the description of psychiatric disorder but let me leave that to one side. Can it really be that what ails so many of us and our fellow citizens arises from their disordered brains? We know that what counts as a disorder is inseparable from the form of life in which it can be judged as abnormal, and many of our current ailments arise from the problems that we have in managing our lives under the contemporary obligations of freedom, autonomy, self-control, and choice. The hypothesis that all these ailments have common mechanisms in the brain seems implausible on the face of it. But in any event, it's proved exceptionally hard to verify. Nonetheless, the rhetoric, the burden of brain disorders, plays a key role in contemporary neuroscience, and that's our second node. Big science has come to the brain. I am myself involved in the uh, social and ethical division of the Human Brain Project. Some of you may have heard of this. It's funded by the European Commission to the tune of 1.2 billion euros over 10 years. And the HBP, as I'll call it, aims to integrate contemporary neuroscientific knowledge of the brain, which now runs at something like 100,000 peer-reviewed publications every year, aims to integrate that knowledge that no human, or no human that I know, could possibly uh, contain within their own brain uh, in a model that can simulate the human brain in a neuromorphic supercomputer. And the argument is that this would not only produce greater understandings of the normal human brain, but crucially, um, it will gain insight into those brain diseases that so burden our nations. Now, there are brain projects in Japan, in China, in Latin America, and the US. Some call the US project a, quote, moonshot for this generation. And Francis Collins, who some of you may know of because of his role in the Human Genome Project, put it thus, our goal to produce the first dynamic view of the human brain in action, revealing how its roughly 86 billion neurons and its trillions of connections interact in real time. This new view will revolutionize our understandings of how we think, feel, learn, remember, and move, transforming efforts to help the more than one billion people worldwide who suffer from autism, depression, schizophrenia, epilepsy, traumatic brain injury, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and other devastating brain disorders. Close quotes. So who would not want 
to fund research to address these devastating disorders, even if they perhaps wondered at placing autism and depression in the same uh, sentence as Parkinson's disease and traumatic brain injury. Nonetheless, despite the undoubtedly virtuous aspirations of these brain projects, it's intriguing to note that the US brain project is funded to about 40% by the US military, or to be more precise by DARPA, the Defense and Allied Research Projects Agency, whose interests include brain stimulation to boost visual identification of satellite images, neuroprosthetics, that is to say cortical implants that enable an individual to control a prosthetic limb, a robot, or a drone by the power of thought alone, thought identification that would enable a readout of specific thoughts from the human brain in action, specific thoughts from the human brain in action being read out by cortical implants analyzed by a computer and made available to others at a distance, and the linking of brains in neural nets, and no doubt much, much more. So there are a few uh, slides there from the DARPA website, thanks to Freedom of Information. Um, perhaps some of these might include modern versions of the so-called stimosievers, which were developed by Jose Delgado in the 1960s, these stimosievers, as the name implies, could both read out and read into the brain, uh, leading to his 1969 book, Physical Control of the Mind, which was perhaps unwisely uh, subtitled towards a psycho-civilized society. In the US, the involvement of DARPA seems to cause little concern, while the Human Brain Project has an explicit commitment not to accept military funding or to involve itself in military uses of its result. But that's a rather forlorn uh, promise, for these neurotechnologies are inescapably dual use, used for civilian and for military purposes. To render the brain knowable is also, or so it is dreamed, to render it governable by, ex by experts, to manage the mind and manage conduct by managing the brain. Now, the US Brain Project uh, recognizes that the neuroreductionist approach of much neuroscience since the 1960s has reached its, <clears throat> has reached its limit. Neuroreductionism was an incredibly powerful experimental strategy, and it was at the heart of the project that was launched by Schmidt in 1962. It was based on the belief that to understand brains, you had to characterize the basic unit of the brain, which was the neuron, its membrane structures, its ion channels, its receptor sites, its firing and signaling mechanisms, its mode of transmission across synapses, and so forth. This molecular vision of the brain generated huge advances, but it was always intended to underpin a, quote, scaling up from neurons to brain circuits and ultimately to functions and behavior. But scaling up has proved incredibly difficult, even with simple creatures, let alone mammals, primates, and humans. Eric Kandel recently won the Nobel Prize for his work on memory, believed very firmly in this neuroreductionist approach. When he trained in the United States, he started off as a psychoanalyst, but he turned to study the simplest creatures that he could find that had memory. In his case, the Californian sea slug, pictured there. The California sea slug has a nervous system of around 1,000 uh, neurons, as opposed to the 86 billion neurons of the human, each of which you could see through a microscope. It also has a primitive memory. Uh, if it has a gill withdrawal reflex. If you touch its gill, the gill withdraws into the body. If you touch it again, the gill withdraws into the body. If you touch it again, the gill does not withdraw into the body. It has, quote, remembered. Cantell spent about 50 years trying to figure out how the sea slug remembered. His autobiography, however, begins with his own memory as a young boy in Vienna at the time of the Anschluss. The storm troopers burst into his house, 
while he was playing on the floor with a little blue train. More than half a century later, he knows an awful lot about the sea slug and how it remembers. But he still does not know anything about how he has that vivid memory of playing with a little blue train. Nonetheless, this was how many thought neuroscience should be done. One cell at a time, learn the mechanism, scale it up to more complex creatures and more complex memories. But perhaps this failure to scale up is not just a temporary or a practical problem. Rather, I suggest it's a fundamental epistemological, even an ontological problem about the nature of mental operations in living organisms whose brains have been developed and exist only in constitutive transactions with their milieu. The US Brain Project is very frank about these difficulties about how much we don't know in trying to move from DNA sequences to proteins, to cells, to synapses, to circuits, to functions, to behavior, to cognition and consciousness. Its hopes that we can achieve this are based in part on the view that new visualizing technologies can at least enable us to envision the brain at the level of functional circuits. To see is to know, and those are some of the rather beautiful pictures produced by the American Brain Project. But this epistemology of the visual is perhaps something that we might also question. In fact, it was one of the things that highly irritated researchers who were using brain scanning techniques, fMRI and PET. They argued that what they were doing, uh, so often illustrated in those wonderful images of bits of the brain lighting up, that they argued that what they were doing was actually best expressed in equations and only loosely captured by these enchanting images that we've become so familiar with. This powerful visual imaginary generated by the lighting up of discrete brain areas when changes in oxygenated blood are imaged has led to thousands of papers claiming to discover the neural location of language, emotion, decision-making, fear, anxiety, beauty, maternal love, autism, dyslexia, and many more. Now, there's a long historical tradition of research on localization going especially back into the work of German neurologists in the 19th century. But there is no reason at all to believe that such functions or malfunctions are localized in this way or that they can be mapped by an arbitrary change in brain chemistry. Indeed, we don't even know at what scale we should be mapping the neurological bases of complex activities. The US brain places its emphasis on these kinds of circuits that I showed you a moment ago. Above the individual cell, but below the level of the whole brain, but nonetheless encapsulated within the brain and the space of the skull itself. I'm going to return to that question later, but before I do that, let me turn to my third node, which concerns drugs. Because the neurocentrism that underpins the brain projects can tell us something about a paradoxical feature of our global present, the use of psychiatric drugs. More and more of our fellow citizens are routinely taking those drugs, notably the antidepressants, in the hope that they will modulate their moods and emotions, reduce sadness and anxiety, enable better fo functioning in social life, in family relations, and much, much more. The neuroleptics, the ones we know as Largactyl or Thorazine, were invented in the 1950s, and they were initially used for control within the asylum, gradually becoming part of the rationale for the control of treatment, uh, the control of patients outside hospital. Also in the 1950s, we saw the invention of the first tranquilizers, Milltown, Librium, and Valium, which became famous as, quotes, mother's little helpers, but rapidly became part of every doctor's pharmacopoeia. 
They were joined by the antidepressants such as imipramine in the late 1950s, amitriptyline in the 1960s, and this availability of drugs, especially those that called themselves antidepressants, went hand in hand with a great increase in the diagnosis of depression uh, amongst people outside the hospital. And finally, we came to the famous selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, such as Prozac and its sisters, which came onto the market in the 1980s to such cultural excitement and rapidly broadened their scope from depression to panic disorders, anxiety, and much more. Initially, these drugs were linked with the idea of coping, coping with the pressures and demands of everyday life. But gradually, the promise changed it became a more positive one. Become yourself again. Take these drugs and you'll become yourself again. You can get your life back. You are able to live your life as an autonomous human being in the everyday world without being dragged down by worries, anxieties, and depression. I'm quoting some of the advertisements uh, in the direct-to-consumer advertising in the US, which I don't have time to show you here. By 2010, the taking of these drugs had become a worldwide phenomenon. But the paradox is that this is occurring at the very time when the scientific rationale for the mode of action of these drugs is losing or has lost credibility. Now, once we could have put the spread of these drugs down to the ambition of the drug companies, and many did blame big pharma, direct-to-consumer advertising, the suborning of psychiatrists, the publication of misleading uh, results, the willful misinterpretation of evidence, the laxity of the regulators, and so forth. And no doubt all of those have played their part together with the hopes of consumers for pills to ameliorate their ills and disappointments, the wishes of doctors to be able to do something for their patients, the attraction of identifying physical causes for distress, and much more. Yet before we blame the drug companies for this, we need to realize that many of these drugs are now out of patent. Most are made in generic form by pharmaceutical companies in developing countries such as Rambaxi in India. And indeed, we need to note that the major pharmaceutical companies are actually moving out of the development of drugs for the central nervous system. Why? Because despite 40 years of research, many new hopes, and many bold claims, it's not proved possible to develop new drugs that are more effective or more specific than those produced by chance in the 1960s. Despite the huge potential market for pharmacological treatment for the dementias, for example, all the drugs have failed in clinical trials. And the drug companies are beginning to think that there are better ways of making money for their shareholders and turning away, rather tragically in my view, from this area of research. Now, we should reflect on the reasons for the epidemic of drug use. But we should also reflect on the failure to create more effective pharmacological interventions. I've just put on the slide here, I don't expect you to read this, a classic paper that was written in 1965 that stated what was the basic hypothesis of almost all these drugs, a neurotransmitter-based hypothesis. If people suffered from a psychiatric disorder, it was because of an anomaly in the neurotransmitters, that is to say, the small molecules that transmit messages from one nerve cell to another nerve cell across the synapse. Either too much or too little of one or the other neurotransmitter was to, brain, to blame. Too little serotonin for depression, too much dopamine for schizophrenia, etc., 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 linked either to the mechanisms for production or reuptake or elimination of these drugs. Mental disorders were neurochemical disorders, and drugs aimed to target and correct problematic neurochemistry. Now, most people now agree that if these drugs work at all, and that's a moot point, especially for mild to moderate conditions, please don't stop taking your drugs without consulting your doctor, it's not because they raise or lower uh, levels of neurochemicals available in the synapses. This neurochemical theory of disorders uh, 
And re reciprocally, the, the, the molecular theory of mechanisms underpinning non-disordered brain functions has proved fundamentally misleading. This isn't everybody's view. Some researchers are exploring the role of one or other of the many hundreds of other chemicals that can act as neurotransmitters. But this vision of the synaptic self is fading away between our eyes, uh, before our eyes. And many are turning to more direct interventions, such as uh, uh, um, uh, deep brain stimulation uh, or transmetic trans. Uh, trans cranial magnetic stimulation, which are based on older ideas about the role of electricity and magnetism, but with even less sense of how these interventions produce their results. This little cartoon from uh, the uh, website of Eli Lilly claiming to show how uh, Prozac works as a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor is a very good illustration of the kind of imagination of the mode of action of these drugs, uh, which is now uh, recognized to be, if not completely false, then at least very significantly false. These drugs don't do nothing, of course. And we know the drugs that mess with our neurotransmitters, usually en masse and rather unselectively, like alcohol, LSD, and psilocybin, certainly do transform experiences, sometimes in ways that seem to mimic psychiatric distress. And indeed, this was one of the observations that led to neurotransmitter research in the first place. And interestingly, it's now becoming a new pathway for research that seeks to use psychedelic drugs therapeutically. But we can learn from this too, and we can term this the principle of non-reversibility. Because a drug helps to alleviate symptoms, it doesn't mean that it acts on the pathway that's generated those symptoms. The trite example is aspirin and headaches. Some critics, notably Joanna Moncrief, have developed this into a broad theory of the ways in which some people find some drugs helpful. It's not because they act on the pathways that lead to distress, but because they act independently and sometimes in a damaging way on other neural processes, thereby mitigating some of the symptoms and experiences, for instance, by blunting emotions or muting perception. And as it happens, this was the view of the early discoverers of the neuroleptics. They thought they caused minor nerve damage, but this was a price worth paying for their therapeutic effects. Now, there's another thing we can learn from the psychedelics. It refers to the terms that will be familiar for every sociologist who studied drug taking, set, and setting. The consequence of ingesting a quantum of alcohol, and indeed, so they tell me, a quantum of cannabis or LSD, are not inherent in the drug itself. They're shaped by expectations. Uh, the way the experience is given meaning, the social setting in which the drug is ingested at a party, in an evening with a partner, or in the long, dark night after the end of a relationship. The opening of the doors of perception by set and setting is well known by those who use or research the uh, psychoactic, psychoactive substances in rituals, for example. But this set and setting uh, context has yet to penetrate most of those, uh, the thinking of most of those who work on legal drugs. I'm reminded of a saying that might have come from Michel Foucault. For 150 years, the search for the neural basis of mental distress has failed. And for 150 years, the response to that failure has been to search for the neural basis of mental distress. Well, it's about as true of the brain as it was of the prison, uh, but at least it tells some of the story. So let's move to my uh, fourth node, which is biomarkers. Or screen and intervene. Some of you may know that one of the major um, elements in contemporary psychiatry is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual produced by the American Psychiatric Association, the so-called DSM. Contemporary forms of DSM are the inheritors of a process of revision 
uh, to the Diagnostic and, Stim uh, and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders that culminated in 1980 in the publication of DSM-3. And in DSM-3, each disorder was categorized on the basis of a checklist of observable symptoms. But nonetheless, it was confidently believed that ultimately researchers would be able to identify a common biological base for each diagnostic category in the path lab, in genetic tests, in physiological indicators, and that ultimately psychiatry, like the rest of medicine, would be able to diagnose actively, accurately on the basis of this pathophysiology and to treat effectively because it knew the biological pathways. Well, over the period since the publication of that first new form of DSM, there has been an intensive search for the biomarkers that could give DSM categories a biological and what some would call an objective underpinning, rather than relying, as we do currently, on case histories, on patient interviews, on observational evidence. And a lot of this research was undertaken uh, by uh, researchers funded by commercial companies who hoped to co-market the test for the biomarker for a disorder and the drug that would treat it. And the uh, research papers are replete with uh, reviews of biomarkers, claims to have discovered biomarkers, and claims to be able very soon to be able to commercialize biomarkers, both for the early detection of disorders in general, and in particular for the early detection of the dementias. And as I say, the hope was that these biomarkers would enable you to diagnose early before the basis of frank disorder and intervene early and preventively. In 2003, Steve Hyman, who was one of the instigators of this of a revision of DSM, outlined his hopes for biomarkers. By combining neuroimaging with genetic studies, he said, physicians may eventually be able to move psychiatric diagnoses out of the realm of symptom checklists into the domain of objective medical tests. Genetic testing of patients could reveal who's at high risk for developing a disorder. Doctors could then use neuroimaging, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to sound too optimistic. The task is daunting, uh, said Steve Hyman, but the current pace of technological uh, development all goes well for uh, progress. But in the five years between 2003 and 2008, Steve Hyman was forced by the evidence to change his mind. And I should say that I have a considerable amount of respect for Hyman and for his analysis of this and other uh, situations about the current plight of psychiatry and neuropsychiatry. None of the biomarkers that had been identified stood the, taste, the test of replication and none of them was available for clinical use. And Hyman was one of the first to recognize the implications of this just five years after his optimism. There are no clear boundaries between ill and well. There are no simple genomic disorders in psychiatry. Common mental diseases are families of diseases that share some symptoms but differ. Similar symptoms can arise from different genetic under, uh, under uh, pinnings. The same genetic variant can be associated with many different diagnoses. It's very difficult to identify risk because the, each uh, genetic uh, variant contributes very little to the disease phenotype and that many diverse environmental factors lead to common diseases. And in the months uh, which were leading up to the publication of the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that was supposed to be based at least in part on these biomarkers, those who are working in this area faced a fundamental dilemma. Were they to conclude that the search for the underlying brain basis of psychiatric disorders had failed, that there would never be any brain-based signatures that could be clinical, clinically useful in the diagnosis and treatment of mental disorders. That, it appeared, was unthinkable to those who had wagered so long and so intensely on the brain. The response from Tom Insull, who was the Hyman successor as the director of the NIMH, seemed equally unthinkable. It was to give up 
the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Now, those of us who know anything about psychiatric research over the last 30 years will know that the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual has been the absolute foundation of psychiatric research. If you're going to put people in a clinical trial, you put people in who are diagnosed with the DSM. They're DSM depressives. They're DSM uh, um, panic disorder. They're DSM anxiety. They're DSM whatever. It's DSM that has shaped the whole setup of psychiatric research over 30 or 40 years. It's DSM that's been the basis of people applying for grants, of them developing their studies, of them producing animal models that claim to replicate in animals human disorders and so on and so forth. So to give up DSM is to give up the results of 30 years of research, of thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of person hours, and of millions and millions of pounds, dollars, and euros that have been spent. But nonetheless, that was the decision that Tom Insull and the National Institute of Mental Health that drives most psychiatric research uh, uh, decided to take. One would no longer categorize on the basis of this manual. Instead, you would mine the data itself, neurobiological, genetic, brain imaging, or whatever, in the search for clusters. You would let data mining of evidence from the brain do the work. Faced with choosing between the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which classifies on the basis of observable distress, and the unproven hypothesis that each of these disorders has a common basis in the brain, those funding the research place their money on the brain. So what are we to make, of, and, and by the way, uh, that is also the approach which is being taken in the Human Brain Project, which I'm a part of. What are we to make of this approach? Yes, indeed, one may find variations, probably small ones, in some of the basic neurobiology involved here that are probabilistically related to an aspect of the disorder. One can perhaps aggregate many of these to find an algorithm that can cluster the data. But do these statistically generated algorithms uh, map causal biological pathways? We don't know. Can one move from probabilities to individual cases? Uh, we don't know. Should one base treatment decisions on what's going on in the brain? That would be unwise. Would brain signatures usher in a new world of personalized medicine, diagnosis, preventive intervention, and so on? That's doubtful. Will patients and clinicians find them plausible? That's doubtful, too. In any event, I'm deeply skeptical of the aspect of personalization that I've termed screen and intervene. Why wait until the child, say some of my colleagues, why wait until the child shows antisocial behavior or depression or bipolar disorder? Let's try to pick up the earliest signs. And since these earliest signs, uh, since these are brain disorders, those earliest signs should be in the brain. Let's search for biomarkers in the brain that will enable us to predict in advance whether a child is liable to develop these disorders. And let's intervene beforehand in order to avert the horrible things that might happen. My colleagues at the Institute of Psychiatry are researching twins as young as eight who show conduct disorder in schools. They use brain scanners, and they've identified patterns of brain activity in some of those twins that they consider to be similar to those of adult psychopaths. For these researchers, it's a good thing if you can predict that a particular child is likely to develop severe antisocial behavior, because the life of that child will be a miserable one. They'll get in trouble with the law, go to reform school, families will be miserable, they'll cost a great deal. Surely it's a good thing to intervene early. This isn't fatalism, they say. The brain is malleable. The whole purpose is treatment and prevention. But what are the consequences of telling a child at the age of, five, uh, of eight that they may be developing uh, the signs of early psychopathy or telling the parents or telling the school or telling the doctors, telling the social workers, telling the child itself that the child has a high risk of developing such a condition. Every odd or problematic behavior that the child shows will be scrutinized as a potential sign of the emerging disorder, not least by the child, him or herself. 
And what about the problems that we know surround screening? The number of false positives, where children are wrongly identified as high risk with all the consequences of the interventions that follow. Recall PSA screening, the prostate-specific antigen screening that became so prevalent in the United States, screening for prostate cancer. The inventor of the PSA test recently referred to it as America's greatest public health disaster because of the number of false positives that were produced and the consequences of the intervention that followed. How about screening asymptomatic women for the signs of breast cancer? Well, you can read the meta-analyses of the studies and make your own mind up as to whether the number of false positives uh, is, uh, justifies, uh, is justified on the basis of the very small number of lives saved. These problems are great even when the markers of future disorder are clear and how much greater would they be uh, in the case of psychiatry when those markers are never going to be clear. So let me move to my penultimate node. Translation from the lab to the world. Of course, biomarkers and screening and intervening are just one dimension of this movement from the lab to the world. During the 50 years between uh, Schmidt and Mountcastle, with whom I began, with the exception of the psychiatric drugs, neuroscience was a matter of laboratories. It was a matter of experiments, proof of principle, understanding things at a cellular and molecular level but it's not a matter of the laboratory anymore. I could talk a lot about one dimension of this escape from the lab, the problem of translation of findings from laboratories to the wild world where they hope to have their point of application. The translational imperative is now so ingrained into the funding system for scientific research that it's constantly necessary to point to the multiple fallacies on which this idea that you can start at the bench and move to the bedside, the multiple fallacies on which this is based. Evidence suggests that the effective time scale of translation from research findings into regular clinical application for those few pieces of research that do translate at all is at least 15 years. The research that translates best and fastest is not basic biomedical research, but applied research. Most changes in the clinic arise not from one piece of research, but from many. The pathway is often from clinical findings back to the lab and not the other way around. This isn't an argument against basic research in neuroscience. It's the reverse. We need to loosen the grip of this translational imperative on our regimes of justification on the imagination of our funders and the demands that it places on those who are doing the research to make completely implausible claims about the rapidity in w with which their findings are going to uh, be in the clinic. But I want to focus just briefly on a different issue of translation, which you might term neuropolitics or governing through the brain. Of course, drugs are one way of governing uh, through the brain. And in a slide which I didn't show, but might just be worth spending a second on, you might just look at this slide, uh, which indicates the neurochemical paradox that I mentioned before, showing you the numbers of Americans that are taking these particular drugs and the number of Europeans that are taking these drugs here, despite the fact that the mode of action is doubtful and, uh, and so is their efficacy. So the drugs are definitely one and perhaps the most successful if success is taken to mean penetration, the successful way of governing through the brain, as indeed were the biomarkers and their logic of screen and intervene. Now, there's been lots of excitement about the potential transformation uh, of the legal system on the basis of an uh, understanding of the neural basis of decision-making, arguments about the end of free will, my brain made me do it, and so on. 
But the evidence, again, to be rather boringly empirical, suggests that the courts have proved rather good at defending themselves against the incursion of speculative claims from neuroscience about the causes of criminal behavior. There's much more to be said about neurotechnologies outside the courtroom. Actually, it's in the analysis of risk, the prediction of risk, and attempts at management and reduction of risk that one is beginning to see the, the emergence of neuroscientific basic, uh, 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 technologies into the legal system. For instance, in the use of neural lie detection technologies, which are ineligible in most jurisdictions in the courtroom, but are nonetheless still used in investigations, not least in India. So neurotechnologies that appear to be able to identify and calculate risk of committing further offenses, these are indeed making some headway, especially in relation to sexual offenses and pedophilia. There's a lot of excitement these days about uh, neuroeducation, though I, I wonder what difference it makes to believe that it's the brain that's transformed by educational interventions rather than the child's psychological capacities. And of course there's neuroeconomics, not that anyone ever really believed that human beings were rational actors, uh, they just uh, created their models of inputs and outputs on that basis, and nudge technologies, which often claim to be based on contemporary neuroscience, actually are not based on contemporary neuroscience at all. Nonetheless, all these, plus neuromarketing, social neuroscience, and so on, demonstrate that many matters that used to be problematized in psychological terms are now beginning to be framed in terms of the brain and neuroscience. And at the most general level, the idea has taken hold that our understanding of neuroscience will enable us to predict and prevent all manner of social and personal problems. So despite all the particulars, it's perfectly clear that neuroscience has ceased to be a matter of the lab and become a matter of everyday life. Now, when critics focus on neuroscience, they tend to seek its negative and reductive consequences. But one of the characteristics of contemporary life sciences is their hopeful nature. Hope not as blind faith or banal optimism, but linked to the possibility that knowledge will enable interventions that will make things better. And that hopeful nature has extended to the brain. If the brain was the determiner of your life, if your life was fixed by your neural architecture, if the characteristics of your brain were outside human control, then where would be the space for hope? But over the last 30 years, the argument has taken shape that the brain is perhaps the most open and plastic model or organ of all. Plasticity is the term that has come to code for this openness of the brain to environmental inputs. Of course, the brain is uh, shaped by experience. We've not long known that. Learning has long been understood to arise from plasticity. Donald Hebb, whose picture is at the top of the screen there, uh, put it in 1949, what fires together, wires together. That's how learning takes place. But from the 1970s onwards, a series of discoveries seemed to show that the argument about plasticity was not just an argument about making links across synapses, but was about the very structure of the brain itself. There was research that showed after brain damage, which appeared to paralyze a limb, the brain could be, quote, rewired, especially by calculated forms of exercise and the limb could then be voluntarily moved again. Some of this research was done with animals, and it was exceptionally controversial because it involved ablating parts of the animal's brains and immobilizing the animals. And in fact, this research was the uh, uh, beginning of, of some of the early campaigns against cruelty to animals and anti-vivisection campaigns. Nonetheless, the argument took shape that if you stimulated people enough after brain damage, their brains could rewire themselves, even in adults. And in this sense, the brain was plastic. And in the 1990s, uh, researchers, in particular a Canadian group led by Michael Meany, 
began to develop a different argument about plasticity. This was an argument about epigenetics, uh, or at least that aspect of epigenetics that focuses upon the way in which the environment shapes gene expression. In mice and in guinea pigs, uh, the earliest relationship that a mother has to her pup shapes the way in which that pup's brain develops, shapes the expression of genes in its brain, shapes the way in which the pup in adulthood will treat its own pups, which in turn shapes the development of their brain, and so on and so on down the generations. Genes, in the sense of the inherited sequence of DNA bases, aren't determinant. The way in which they play out in the body is a matter of milieu. And the third major change here arose from the work of Elizabeth Gould and her colleagues, which gradually convinced skeptics that, that's her down there, that uh, gradually convinced skeptics that even the adult mammalian brain was capable of making new neurons. It wasn't downhill all the way from childhood with every cigarette you smoked and every out glass of alcohol you drunk. Uh, the brain could create new neurons, they were functionally integrated, and the number of new neurons that were created was a consequence of environmental input and stimulation. In this new argument, the brain can rewire itself in, re in relation to external stimuli. The expression of the genes is shaped by environmental input. The brain can create new neurons in relation to stimulation. In other words, you have an open dynamic, plastic brain, in which to use the phrase that's now becoming common, experience can get under the skin. The idea that experience can get under the skin, can shape the brain for good or ill, is perhaps the fundamental platform that's enabled neuroscience to claim it has a social relevance. And it's particularly relevant in strategies for intervening in children, both arguments that one is beginning to see developing in the United Kingdom and elsewhere, that the consequence of deprivation, early childhood deprivation, is a transformation in the way in which the brain develops, and it's this transformation in brain structure that leads to the problems that those children have as they grow into adulthood. In the UK, this so-called cycle of deprivation was understood in psychological form, in the way in which early experiences from bad parenting shaped the psyche of the child and made the child itself a bad parent, passing the problems down the generations. Today, these kinds of arguments are mapped not onto the psyche, but onto the brain, uh, often using images of children like these ones over here from very deprived backgrounds and then arguing that these can support uh, arguments about less severe forms of deprivation and the need for action. And the other side of this is a growing uh, discourse on resilience and how different ways of dealing with your children can help build the child, uh, build resilience into the child so that child is able to deal with all the uh, unfortunate circumstances that life throws upon them. So it's clear that interventions into childhood in particular, those early years, those incredible years when the child's brain is developing so fast in these ways of thinking, are becoming shaped, perhaps not fundamentally shaped, but beginning to be shaped in terms of understandings of the brain. So the question I guess we're faced with is what difference does it make if the effect of early experience on child development is coded in neurobiological rather than psychological terms. Well, I'm coming, if I have not already come, to the end of my time. Um, so let me talk very briefly about personhood before I wrap up. I started by saying that this research was an exercise in historical ontology. Who do we think we are? What languages do we use to understand ourselves? How do we judge ourselves and explain our failings? What kinds of creatures have we become? Have we stopped thinking of ourselves as psychological beings and begun to think of ourselves as biological or neurobiological beings? And some of those who work in the sociology of the neurosciences do indeed suggest that this fundamental transformation 
has occurred. Alain Ehrenberg argues that we've become cerebral subjects. Fernando Vidal argues that we've moved from a regime of personhood to one of brainhood, where the state of being a person and the state of having a brain are now I identical. And Emily Martin, whose work I like a lot and admire greatly, has argued very strongly against what she sees as neuroreductionism, in which she argues that what becomes lost is culture, meaning, language, and signification. Many will remember a phrase from Clifford Geertz, human beings are creatures suspended in webs of significance that they themselves have, sun, have spun. For many in the human sciences, it's not biology or neurobiology, but meaning, language, and culture that makes humans human. And this focus on the brain effaces, obscures all those things that we know uh, make us the kinds of humans that we've become. Now, I don't think contemporary neuroscience thinks of uh, human beings merely as brains on legs, nor do I think that culture, meaning, signification, even the psychological or the mental, has disappeared in contemporary neurobiology. We humans aren't seen as brains, but as persons with brains. It's not that you are your brain, but that you have a brain. You're shaped by your brain at the same moment that you shape it. And hence, and this is the governing ourselves through our brains, the argument that you collectively and individually have a responsibility to take care of your brain. Take care of your brain, take responsibility for your brain, become familiar with your brain, become a manager of your own neural state. If your brain is flexible and malleable, then you can't leave it to others to make sure it's shaped in the right way. You've got to take your brain into your own hands. You have to learn some techniques, and sorry for that, you have to learn some techniques and technologies of your own neurobiological self, and you don't have to spend long on the internet to discover some of the technologies that you can use um, and uh, to begin to recognize that you have an obligation as an individual, as a parent, to govern, manage the brains of yourself and the brains of your children. So it's not clear if neuroscience will gain a hold on our existence in the same way that psychology did in the 20th century. But we can begin to delineate some of the contours of these emerging futures. And in doing so, perhaps we can play a part uh, in shaping them. Uh, that at least is one aim of the critical friendship that I mentioned at the beginning. From my point, there are three things that one might want to urge upon uh, my friends in neurosciences. The first is the obligation of humility, to beware making all those outrageous and very exaggerated claims about what we know about the brain, but also for those critics uh, to beware making some very exaggerated claims about what neuroscience is about. Secondly, perhaps a lesson to the funders to stop forcing those who work in this area to make those claims as a condition of getting their research money. Because it seems to me that nothing is likely to, uh, more likely to lead to skepticism and cynicism about science than all sorts of claims about what can be done that never come to pass. So mitigate that translational imperative. But third, I think, and this is the subject of some other work that I'm doing, to remember what I've called the lesson of vitalism. That when one's talking about brains, one's not talking about brains in vats. One's talking about brains in skulls and skulls in bodies, brains that are constantly enmeshed in stimulation, in nervous impulses from the outside, from the moment of conception onwards, brains that are in living, vital organisms, uh, in, in, in constant transaction with their milieu. And the more we know from our uh, understanding of the way in which brains as a whole work, the more we are becoming aware of how malleable, how open, how transformed brains are by everything that happens to the organism of which they're a part. <clears throat> 
And that's a message not only to our neuroscientists, but also a message to psychiatrists. But also, I think, it's a message to social scientists. The social scientists need, perhaps, to reach out to the openness that is becoming evident within the life sciences in general and neurosciences in particular, and to begin to develop a different relationship with them rather than that of critique that has characterized that relationship for the last 50 years. If they did so, if they helped overcome mechanism if they help replace the human organism into its dynamic interaction with its milieu, if they began to breach the walls that our disciplinary organization has erected between the two sciences of the living, the social sciences, and the life sciences, then perhaps neuroscience could become a genuinely human science. And I'll just leave these quotes on the slide uh, as I conclude, but with apologies for going on too long. Thank you for your attention. Sorry for thank, exceeding my time. Thank you so much, Professor Rose, for, for this extremely rich talk, which I'm sure will stimulate a lot of discussion. We have about maybe uh, 25 minutes, uh, up to half an hour for, for discussion. Uh, so um, I just open open the uh, floor for comments and, and questions. Who who would like to to begin? All right, go ahead. Yeah, please speak uh, are up. The, are there mics? Otherwise, you have to shout. Okay, um, so I would call myself a neo-vitalist, uh, um, someone who uh, learns the lessons that were taught to us uh, by even by Claude Bernard at the beginning of experimental uh, medicine, that you had to regard the organism as a whole, as more than the sum of its parts, but perhaps even more the lesson of those like Kurt Goldstein, who recognized that sort of holism that developed in Germany at the time of, of Goldstein, that recognized the nature of the organism in its environment, or people like von Uxel, who do the same, who recognize, in fact, that there is no such thing as the environment, that every organism creates its own milieu for itself, or the lesson of, uh, of my favorite uh, uh, philosopher of, uh, of the life sciences, uh, Georges Congiem, who argues that it is in the nature of living organism to create and shape their milieu in relation to their own aspirations and demands, something which I think is particularly compelling when one thinks about the condition of laboratory animals that are so often used in this research, uh, who are in what, uh, what uh, Kongian would call a catastrophic situation, in that the very organisms that are used to understand living creatures, that purport to be living creatures, are deprived of the very thing that's fundamental to a living creature, which is the capacity to shape its own, its own milieu. So in the, uh, as I'm sure you will know, that in the, in the critical response to what was, what was thought of as genetic reductionism in the human genome projects, there were many who were criticizing the genetic program of, approach uh, and arguing that uh, if you were going to understand the ways in which genes work, both in evolution and in the creation of any individual human being, you had to understand genes in development. Now, many, many, many years ago, sometime last century, when I was a biologist, a baby biologist, I was a developmental biologist, where you recognized, um, I mean, someone said once, nothing makes sense in human biology except in terms of evolution. Well, for a developmental biologist, nothing makes sense in biology except in the axis of time. 
as the organism develops in constant interaction with its environment in the axis of time. Is there empirical research that's seeking to do this? Well, I believe there is, and in another part of the work that I'm doing at the moment, <clears throat> As an example of trying to break the boundaries between the neurosciences and the life sciences and place the organism back into its milieu, my colleagues and I are looking at what we call the urban brain. Now, to be very quick about this, there's a long history of research that demonstrates there are specific patterns of psychiatric disorder in urban space, uh, and they persist. So what's the relationship between psychiatric disorder and urban existence? How does urban existence get under the skin? The classic argument is that urban existence gets under the skin or features of it through stress. Stress operates on the hormonal system, the hormonal system uh, and the immune system shape brain development and so on. That's probably inadequate, but I think in doing some research, and there's some interesting neurobiological research that's trying to do this, in doing this research to see how different types of urban existence from the moment of conception onwards up through adult life might shape the emergence of different, times of different types of psychopathology, there are some things there that give me some give me some hope. And we, my colleagues and I at King's, are working with neuroscientists, with urbanists, with, with epidemiologists to try and understand this, even developing little apps that people will carry around with them that will monitor their levels of stress and other things as they move through different parts of, 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 of the urban experience and seeing what's happening there. I'm an optimist about these things, unlike almost all my colleagues. All right. Well, thank you very much for a very informative and uh, useful lecture. Uh, I, I would like to continue from what you just said. Um, the um, uh, research on um, brain plasticity seems to offer a lot of perspectives for um, preventive uh, social and health policy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there is a, another possibility of uh, kind of medicalizing the political um, issues that are um, involved in that kind of uh, policy. Uh, what, what is your opinion on the medicalization thesis um, in, in this particular area? I know uh, your point about uh, neuropharmacology, but... Uh, but uh, how, how, is that, um, how is the medicalization uh, thesis uh, related to the brain plasticity research? I mean, you're absolutely right about the double-edged nature of these arguments about brain plasticity. The way in which Michael Meany's work has been taken about the uh, consequence of early maternal uh, relations with, uh, with guinea pig pups has been taken up and interpreted in, uh, in, in social policies is, uh, is another version to be, to be crude about it of I blame the mother um, and it can easily be seen in, in that way. It can easily be seen as a highly individualizing uh, an, a, analysis uh, which seeks to locate uh, causes in the specific relations of an individual with an unstimulating environment and therefore tries to direct uh, interventions onto that, un exactly onto that unstimulating environment. And it has to be said that the main interventions that are linked to these arguments about early child deprivation and the brain are not actually drug interventions. Uh, there's a program which I didn't have a chance to talk about called Those Incredible Years which argues uh, very clearly that the consequences of early deprivation of stimulation operate through the brain, but its, uh, its intervention strategy is to seek to highly enrich the environment in which the child is living and the relations that the mother has with the child. So it's not always the case that if you have a neurobiological account, you're going to have a medical or a drug-based intervention. So things are a little bit more complicated than that. In the same way, the work on plasticity that we're trying to do on the urban brain is linked to questions about urban policy and urban planning rather than attempts to intervene upon specific individuals in the way in which I think is understood by the medicalization thesis. Uh, 
Now, I've been quite critical of the medicalization thesis because I think it can, in many ways, offer, for, uh, offer critics a shortcut to critical thought. What's wrong, what's happening, medicalization, what's wrong with it, medicalization, what's the solution, anti-medicalization, where you know in some cases that medicalization is rather a good thing uh, if you have drugs that work, and you know in some cases that medical interventions or interventions which are linked to a biomedical understanding of the condition operate to change that condition by changing social and cultural uh, relations. Take, for instance, the way in which strategies to, to um, uh, relate to HIV and AIDS thought of as a biomedical condition, but nonetheless those strategies combined drug interventions with interventions to transform uh, cultural and social beliefs. So uh, I, I think the situation is quite a complicated one and we need to analyze it in, in, uh, in relation to the particular examples. Um, uh, so that would be a, a short, short answer. Uh, <clears throat> Thanks a lot. I'm Thomas Wagner from here. Uh, I'm interested in, uh, in the optimism and the enthusiasm and how you understand it. Uh, I see uh, the interest in, in, curing, uh, in, in curing people and helping the alleviate suffering. That's one uh, driving force. And I can understand the drive, another driving force, which is the interest in controlling people. Uh, then I think there's a third driving force, which is the interest in, in the new, the, the aesthetic beauty of the new. You can go, you, you mentioned in, at, in, at the end of your talk, optimism about having your app with you and, and you see the stress level going up and down as you move through London. Uh, and there's this, uh, so is that, is that a third factor, the, uh, the aesthetic pleasure of the new that comes in? So we have alleviating suffering, we have controlling people, we have the pleasure of the new, uh, uh, and we have perhaps also the pleasure of getting rich. If you promise these three things, maybe you can get a buck and earn money. Uh, so these are four attractions I see, but I wonder how you describe your own optimism at the end when you mentioned the connection between, uh, between brain research and urban planning. Is that one of the four I mentioned is the connection there that you uh, take part in a project which aims at new ways of, uh, of social planning that's beneficial for human well-being? Is that the, the driving force? Uh, then, then it's technology technological project and not a, a, a human science project? Uh, I mean, wh and it's a real question. I mean, what is the no, optimism you see? I'll, I'll try and give you a real answer uh, to that real question. Why, why optimism? Um, the, I'm, I'm very fed up with the highly ritualized, routinized, and repetitive form that critique has taken within the social sciences. That's point one seems to me that it often works at a level which fails to engage with the complexity of what it's criticizing. It has almost no traction in the real world. Uh, what it does do is create a lot of self-satisfaction amongst the people who can pat themselves on the back because they're very critical. That's thing number one. Two, um, I do believe there's been a transformation in the life sciences. It's something that I've argued, I argued extensively in my book called The Politics of Life Itself. I do believe that there's an opening there for a much more open, for a much more flexible, uh, certainly a way, a move away from determinism, a move towards a much more flexible way of thinking about the relationship between their organis organisms and their milieu. And I think if that is opening, is holding out a hand, or even maybe just a finger to the social and human sciences, one should perhaps grasp it rather than uh, bat it, bat it away. Um, thirdly. Um, I work a lot with neuroscientists. Perhaps I've gone native. Um, I was a, a biologist myself when I, a, a many, many years ago. Um, and um, I, 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 re I regret the fact that many of those in the social sciences don't have sufficient respect for what's done in the human sciences and the life sciences, where the levels of reasoning are often highly complex, very sophisticated, uh, where, where, where uh, evidence builds upon evidence and argument builds upon argument, where truth claims have to go through some quite difficult processes in order to become in the true, 
Take what happened in the Human Genome Project, where it was confidently expected that humans would have 300,000 or 100,000 coding sequences, and in the end, it proved impossible to make that true. It's not always impossible or so difficult to make things true in the social and human sciences. If you can muster enough rhetoric and enough allies, as Bruno Latour tells us, you can make almost anything true. Um, so I think we should be a little bit more humble ourselves. And lastly, I'm optimistic. Or I, I, human beings are animals. They're very particular kinds of animals, but they are organisms. They are born, they live, they mature, and they get sick, and they die. Many of the fundamental questions that sociology, my adopted discipline, have dealt with do concern themselves with these forms of, of human social suffering. I myself think that it's quite difficult to understand human social suffering without recognizing that it is the suffering of particular kinds of organisms, human organisms, and that there is some virtue, therefore, in trying to collaborate with those who have a knowledge of the life sciences, in trying to understand the forms of those sufferings and the way in which they uh, may be alleviated. And finally, at the, in the twilight of my career, if I might put it like that, uh, <laughs> after too many decades of doing this kind of thing, I think there's a bit of an imperative to be hopeful to seize what one can affirm uh, and to work with what one might be able to develop and produce into a, into a different kind of a future rather than regretting the fact that we live in the worst of all possible worlds. I hope that's a serious answer to a serious question. <clears throat> I think you're next. There's the microphone. There. Yes, thank you very much. That was very stimulating. Um, I guess I had a specific question about um, attention I detected in your talk. Um, so um, at one point when you were discussing early, invent early um, detection of conduct disorders that is known to be linked to psychopathy, you expressed some worries about um, early identification, having problems of false positives, but also problems of uh, identification, and you also mentioned some sort of economic reasons, which I didn't know quite what they were. But, but then later on, and, and I guess my own impression is that these issues, some of them can be overcome by combating stigmatization in general in society with respect to that. And another way in which there can be overcome is precisely by acknowledging some of the, your points about neural plasticity. And later on, you seem to acknowledge that, you know, um, because we uh, have all this information about uh, neural plasti plasticity, we should use this information for, you know, Program, programs with child development and, and that because that's probably the most effective means of intervening and in life trajectories um, such that we can improve those lives of both those individuals but potentially also when it comes to someone like that might be in risk of psychopathy that might harm other people in the future. So I just wondered whether you're optimistic or more pessimistic with respect to this point. Thank you for the question. Uh, I can assure you there are many, many tensions and contradictions in my argument, but uh, um, there are many tensions and contradictions in the, in, the, in the issues. So let me start by saying that this is a, a kind of good example of what I'm trying, what I'm calling critical friendship. Um, I, I work with the people who are developing uh, arguments for early intervention in the case of antisocial conduct, severe antisocial conduct and, and psychopathy. They are extremely well-meaning people. They recognize that kids, some kids do have severe antisocial behavior and whatever you might think about it, develop uh, 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 ways of, of conducting themselves that don't seem to conform to the normal rules of, of, of morality, that their lives are miserable and those of their families are miserable. And they absolutely want to intervene. The, the object of identification is intervention and therapy. So I don't uh, want to cast any aspersions on what they're trying to do. 
What I want to do is, what I hope to do is to work with them to try and think about whether or not these are the most effective ways of, try, of seeking uh, to, to intervene. And I think in the case of the, those particular early intervention arguments, there are actually some technical problems with the genetics. There are some technical problems with the brain imaging. There are some technical problems about the, uh, um, the extent to which they are able to predict at a high level the risk of someone going on to commit a, a, a serious offense or having serious antisocial conduct. That is to say, the probabilities that they are discovering are extremely low, and therefore the risk risks of uh, false positives are extremely high, and if the risks of false positives are high and the consequence of false positives are bad, then uh, if the risk of false positives are high and it's just a question of taking aspirins or something like that, then fine, it doesn't matter how many false positives you get, except you might get a bit of stomach bleeding, but if the risks of false positives are high and the consequences of false positives are severe, as I believe they would do in identifying a child as likely to develop into, a, into someone with severe antisocial behavior, then I think one needs to be very, very, very cautious. So... That's what I mean by critical friendship, and it's a difficult line to, to, uh, uh, to take, you know, because the reasons why these people are funded is because of the belief that pretty damn soon, as we, PDQ, as we would say in England, that PDQ, these results are going to enable ident early identification intervention. Why the economics? Because another colleague of mine, um, uh, Martin Knapp, both at the Institute of Psychiatry and at King's College London, and some of his colleagues have predicted that if a child shows antisocial behavior at school, by the time that child is 26 years old, that child will have cost the state something like eight to 10 times as much as the child who does not uh, show antisocial conduct because of all the consequences of intervention, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the argument that is often made for there being a cost-benefit a cost-benefit argument for the benefits of these early interventions. Even if they're costly in the short term, the, uh, the costs that they defray in the medium and long term make it worth it. This is exactly the argument that another colleague of mine, Richard Layard, made about, the, about early intervention using psych psychological therapies rather than waiting later and giving people drugs. But it was a cost-benefit. Although psychological therapies are very expensive, the amount of uh, cost that they defray later on uh, makes it actually economical to, to do that. So that's what I meant about the economic argument. Now, I don't think one should be completely dismissive about the economic argument. You know, we're all paying taxes and uh, keeping people in prison, as we all know, and, uh, and we can learn from Michel Foucault and others, is a terrible thing to happen to people. It produces, it's very iatrogenic. Imprisoning people produces as many bad effects as more than it resolves. So if one can think of alternative pathways, it seems to me not such a bad idea to try and do that. But undoubtedly, there are tensions, there are difficulties, there are ethical problems in trying to weave one's way through these difficult kinds of questions. Um, but kind of, I prefer to engage with them rather than to stand aside and, uh, 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 and think that, uh, that, that engagement is, is, in, is inescapably corrupting and therefore one should try and avoid it. <clears throat> All right, we, we have a couple of more questions. We don't have very much time, but we, we, we will take, take at least two more questions, so please go okay. ahead. Okay, thank you very much for interesting talk. Uh, you asked for questions on, on theory and governmentality, so I hope this is one. Uh, I'd like to hear you articulate your epistemological kind of view now when working with neuroscience, and has your earlier work, um, have you had to challenge your views on, let's say, yeah, sin, yeah, with this line of work. And what, what about, I mean, do you need to engage with realism? Um. Um, I've never thought my early work was anti-realist. Um, it was just about the consequences of cer certain things coming to be true. Uh, in a sense, my, my work has always been concerned with truth rather than reality. It was a lesson I learned a very long time ago when I was very young, a Marxist working at that time, working with the concept of ideology. And the concept of ideology thinks that the most powerful social consequences come from thought that is false. 
And suddenly, a blinding revelation came to me, which is probably not blinding or revelatory to any of you, that the most powerful uh, consequences come for things that have come to be true, come to be taken as true. And it seems to me that you can analyze the ways in which things come to enter the true, uh, how they are deployed in the true, and what the consequences are of generating certain truths without yourself taking an epistemological position in the sense of arbitrating whether they're true or whether they're true or false. You can be consequentialist about it, uh, and that's how I've tried to conduct my work. And in a sense, it's for others uh, to, to determine whether or not those truth claims are justified. Now, I think there is a difference now between, between my work now and my work. Then it's, uh, I was looking for various reasons at, at governing the soul, which I wrote about a thousand years ago. Uh, and it's un undoubtedly the case there that I was pretty critical of some of the truth claims that were being made by the humanistic psychologists that I was analyzing. But it played a very uh, reduced part in the, in the argument. Now, I think, trying to couple that analysis with what I call critical friendship it is necessary to draw or, or to pay more attention to the conditions under which certain claims come to be true and even point to the fact that their emergence into truth is problematic. So the emergence into truth of what I've called very rather, rather rudely blobology, uh, the argument that you can learn a lot by seeing which parts of the brain, quotes, light up when an individual in a scanner is given a task to do on the basis of changes in blood oxygenation. I think there are major problems with the way in which those things have emerged into the true, at least insofar as the way they've got out of the lab, because the closer you get to the brain scanners, the more critical they are of the way in which so much attention is focused on the blobs that light up. So... So it's, I'm, I'm sort of, I, 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 so yes, things have changed a little bit, but still I'm concerned with how things get into the true. Um, and I'm concerned to try and get away from critique and trying to find another way of engaging critically. I want to make a distinction between critique and critical thought. Critical thought just tries to parcel things out in some way, rather than feeling that it's got to undercut them by saying, oh yes, this is how they've come into existence, and by virtue of that, they're false. All right, one more question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm coming uh, from the direction of performance studies in, into, into uh, this, and, and I'm looking at uh, ritual behaviors, uh, the relationship of indoctrination and propaganda to to uh, um, uh, constraint in in uh, daily life and and habitual behaviors in particular, uh, I'm, and and I'm interested in in um, ritual forms of release and and I, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more about psychotropics and and the relationship. Of uh, alternative consciousness to uh, uh, techniques to to the research that you're doing. Well, there's about a hundred things in there that I'd like to talk to you about, which I know more about than than the one you've actually asked me about. I'm I'm kind of interested in habitual behaviour and the idea of habit, and I think one of the things that neuroscience shares with a lot of uh, critical thought, radical thought in in my youth, um, and indeed with dear Sigmund, who I put up on the board here, uh, is the recognition that uh, the ego is not master in its own house, that so much of what shapes the way in which we conduct ourselves in the world happens way below the level of consciousness, uh, and happens, in a sense, at a level which could never become conscious, um, and how things turn, how habits are shaped, uh, and how habits shape us, what becomes habitual, um, uh, because there are some things that become habitual, some things that we can make habitual. So all that, I think, is really interesting. And to that extent, neuroscience, I'll just say this because it's, 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 it's not quite an answer to your question. To that extent, neuroscience is quite radical in, in, its, in its critique of humanism, in its critique that uh, the ego and the ego is ultimately the master in its own house. And so many of the criticisms of uh, neuromania are object to that, uh, that anti, that theoretical anti-humanism that I think one does see in a lot of, in a lot of neuroscience. 
Habits are really interesting. Um, the only thing I would say, I'm, I'm not really not an expert on the psychotropic drugs, except to say two things. One is that at the very beginning of the, which I sort of hint, hinted at, so at the very beginning of this neurochemical model of how psychopathology emerged were, were the psychedelic drugs. Were, was LSD in particular. LSD and the argument that people who had LSD had experiences that mimic the experiences of those with schizophrenia. Now, actually, I think the, le the extent to which they did mimic the experiences of those who were diagnosed with schizophrenia was really much more limited than was, uh, was thought of, but nonetheless, this led to the, to the, to the belief that if, if you mess with neurochemistry and it produced altered experiences, then perhaps reversing that argument, people who had altered experiences had messed up neurochemistry. And I don't necessarily think that that reverse in exactly that way happened. Um, there's a long history of the use of psychedelics therapeutically uh, in, the, in the 60s, uh, not just by Tim Leary and Ronnie Lang and people like that, but uh, actually in the basement of my very own general practitioner's uh, uh, offices in Bloomsbury, they used, uh, they used psychedelics. Um, they went out of fashion for all sorts of reasons, which I don't even have to go here. And what's kind of interesting is the fact that some people now, given that so many have, have given up any hope in the drugs that we now have, the SSRIs, etc., are beginning to think of other pathways by which you might intervene in the brain. And, and the person who I've mentioned, some of you may, may know, um, a, a, a very well-known psychopharmacologist in the UK, now at Imperial College, called David Nutt. Uh, David Co Nutt came to prominence uh, because he was the uh, chair of the government's drug advisory board. Um, and they'd done some research on, on risks in relation to drug taking. And they'd uh, looked at the risks in relation to different kinds of drugs. Of course, the risks in relation to drugs bear absolutely no relationship at all to the regulatory regimes. You know, high-risk drugs are not regulated. Low-risk drugs are regulated. And having done this work in a public pronouncement, uh, uh, Professor Nutt pointed to the fact that actually more children die every year from falling off their ponies than die every year from taking ecstasy. Um, his uh, contract as the chair of the government's drug advisory board uh, was terminated very rapidly thereafter. Um, nut by name or nut by nature, as the, as the uh, popular press put it. But he's a very serious guy. And actually, David Nutt's laboratory at uh, Imperial College is doing some research on ketamine, on MDMA, on LSD and psilocybin, and the extent to which they might uh, again be uh, used for therapeutic purposes. So that's the... And why I made a brief, a brief allusion to set and setting is because those who work, and you, I'm sure you know much more about this than I do, those who work with those psychedelics know that the consequence of taking the psychedelics depends hugely on all sorts of things about the social milieu, whereas much as I admire David Nutt's work, that again thinks that the consequence is inherent in the molecule and not in the milieu. So I think the fact that the effects of the molecule are shaped so much by the milieu is perhaps something that one might take more generally uh, as, a, as a kind of point of critical entry to these neurochemical models. All right. Now I think our time is running out. So, so thank you once again so much, Professor Rose. Thank you. And thanks for your question. Thank you all for coming. I should just say, I, I can't actually remember the name of the journal that it's published in, but a, a sort of rather more organized uh, version of this presentation, uh, which is called something like Governing the Brain or something like that, has actually, I understand, been translated into, into Finnish, so uh, it may be available for you. Thank, thank you. <laughs>